far for this uh, registration groups where uh, established scientists like me, for example, uh, who knows the, all these administrative and bureaucratic uh, hurdles, is uh, hosting in his or her lab several international groups. Uh, so international scientists don't, don't, don't have to care about purchasing, hiring, uh, making sure that his uh, lab members are in the lab and uh, know what to do day, on a day-to-day -day basis. They can uh, manage their labs uh, by Skype or by any other means of communication. And uh, on occasions, uh, arriving to the cousin university for face-to-face -face meeting. But uh, the lab, the host lab, the open lab, will take care of all day-to-day -day activities. And uh, this is um, why translational medicine. First of all, um, this is actually a good uh, uh, diagram of uh, why translational medicine is important uh, nowadays in uh, medical field. Uh, there is a lot of basic research going on, but uh, in order to, go, to get to the clinic, at least for the clinical trials, you have to go through so-called the death plan where uh, biologists are, don't know what medical doctors need and medical doctors uh, cannot communicate directly uh, and efficiently with uh, uh, biologists. Plus, uh, there is uh, often lack of funding, so only a collaborative effort uh, can uh, help to bridge this gap and uh, to transfer, translate basic research uh, results into the clinical setting. And uh, Catholic University makes the, uh, this translation of medicine its priority. Plus, uh, as you know, uh, well, just a few days ago, uh, Sir Martin Grant, the director of NHS uh, from uh, UK, was in Kazan and uh, we were interviewing him and asked uh, what was <coughs> University clinic, university hospital, rural uh, level. And he said, of course, uh, research, that uh, scientists uh, or doctors need to be involved in the research, and the uh, medical students need to be involved in the research, and the uh, university hospital, university clinic uh, has to provide the best uh, care and uh, the, more, uh, the most advanced uh, techniques available and develop this technique. So, uh, the Kazan University recognizes this importance and uh, uh, by translating the research into the clinic and uh, introducing it into the <laughs> clinic practice is our strategy to uh, excel our medical school. And, uh, well, I'm probably out of time, but uh, we will be talking about all this uh, for the next week. Uh, we are most of we are living on Saturday evening, uh, and uh, we will have plenty of opportunity to discuss uh, uh, all our programs, uh, facilities, uh, and uh, uh, put together plans for the future. Thank you very much. And uh, well, and it's my pleasure to invite Nigel. Our friend uh, and the close collaborator from the University of Washington. Uh, well, we know why we're here. We're all passionate about cancer research. 
and addressing the challenge that cancer represents for our societies this unites us all. And I was thinking about how we do that, and that really sort of narrowed down my thinking about the importance of essential partnerships, and how we cooperate and work together to address cancer. Uh, I'm a professor of oncology and of basic research, but I'm also the director of global research at Nottingham. And that really underpins how we do our research. We're globally focused and we want to collaborate widely. Uh, so the overview of what I want to talk about is the different types of uh, partnerships that underpin cancer research, multidisciplinary clinical teams, and the culture that's required for them, for them to work effectively. As Albert has already alluded to, the most effective clinical provision is underpinned by research. And I'm going to give two case studies of how international partnerships work to drive research and accelerate advances. I'm going to talk about our collaboration between Cornell, our colleagues in Sweden, in Lund, Nottingham, and here in Kazan, and also more locally about how some developments in breast cancer were led from Nottingham and now have had global impact. But first, a little bit about our institutions, about me. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have a foot in two different camps. So I'm predominantly based in Nottingham in the UK, but I also still have a link with Cornell. I've been um, faculty there for, for nearly 20 years. And this has given me uh, useful insights into the different cultural approaches to research and how we can capitalize on those and learn from our differences. A little bit more about Nottingham. Uh, it's in the heart of England. Uh, for a small island, you're as far from the sea as you can get, but we're in the centre of about an hour north of London. We're a globally focused university. Uh, we were founded in Nottingham in 1881 by Victorian University. But we've always looked outwards. We have campuses in Malaysia, built in 2000, and also in China in 2004. And Russia is now our great priority. We recognise we can learn so much from working with Russian scientists. So it's one of the key areas that we want to develop new links and learn and work with the Russian scientists. We have a global aspiration that reflects our student body. And we have 35,000 students, 9,000 of which are international. We have a very international academic staff um, and postgraduate and um, um, uh, um, undergraduate recruitment, and that's really important to us culturally. We, we embrace that and we want more of that. So we try to facilitate that with visas, we try to facilitate uh, housing. It's very important for us that we get people in. We are enriched by this. Uh, a little bit about our clinical care. Uh, we claim to have the largest teaching hospital in Europe. This is one of the three hospital centres. It's about one square mile and we cover all of the uh, uh, clinical disciplines. We are the tertiary referral center for four and a half million people, and we have a large, in fact, two different medical curriculums for running the medical school. Okay. We're also rare in the UK in that we are a broad university. We cover all of the academic disciplines, including veterinary medicine, and we have international strengths in that. We are ranked eighth in the UK for research excellence, and we're ranked around 70 75 in the QS rankings. There's a couple of things that you might have not be raised either in collaboration with Nottingham, so Dolly the sheep was cloned by some colleagues that were in Roslyn that then uh, we poached, so Dolly's clones were there. But also MRI was invented and developed there, and that's underpinned a lot of our research in how to integrate imaging into clinical practice. In terms of cancer, our greatest success is the Nottingham Prognostic Index, I'll talk a little bit more about how that is a good example of how basic research can underpin clinical care. So moving on, I want to talk about multidisciplinary clinical teams and how those can relate to basic research, such as myself. Over the last 30 years, multidisciplinary teams have been adopted worldwide, where there is a integration of clinical expertise in oncology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, primary care, the nursing staff, typically, certainly in the UK, those are chaired and coordinated, usually by a non-clinician. The evidence supports this because sometimes having a non-clinician chair those multidisciplinary teams helps avoid silos. They help reach a patient-focused clinical decision. 
And multidisciplinary teams are expensive, so if you're going to invest in those, they have to work efficiently. So this is a good example of how taking an innovative approach of having a non-clinician chair a multidisciplinary team unanticipatedly improves the outcome of the patients. So those are now uh, broadly used throughout the UK, the United States, and Australasia. But how do we make more of those multidisciplinary teams? Well, if we look internationally, the very best cancer centers, particularly those in the United States, integrate their clinical multidisciplinary teams with basic research. And as Brian, I think, will outline later, that works particularly well, where the basic researchers are involved in with research with clinicians weekly. If understand the clinical questions as a non-clinician, I depend upon clinicians to advise me to ensure that the type of research that I'm involved in is clinically relevant. It can be very interesting to follow biological curiosities, but if we don't bring this back to a patient-centered approach, then we're only really chasing curiosities. So in the UK, we're gradually beginning to adopt this model where clinical and basic researchers are co-localized, embedded together, and that is greatly accelerating our research achievements, I think. With that in mind, Nottingham is now building its own cancer, uh, Center for Cancer Science, where we will have clinician basic research co-localized in one building, and hopefully by the end of the next summer, we will visit us in Nottingham, we will be able to show you our new building that's currently This expanded in 2009 when I met Dr. Miftakova during a month-long visit uh, and where I was first introduced to Kazan, to the university here, when I met two scientists that had been trained from here who were so impressive with their knowledge, with their motivation and drive that I assumed that they were senior postdocs. I subsequently learned they were just starting their masters. And that was in the back of my mind. This is an impressive place. I want to learn more about Kazan, and I want to work more with Kazan. Over time, our collaborations with Kazan and with other universities have expanded. In Nottingham, we now have a large cohort of people who visited Lund, UNIA, and Sweden, and now have thankfully joined us in Kazan. And those interpersonal relationships are crucial to enabling our research collaborations to go forward. As effective as Skype is and Zoom, there is nothing better than a face-to-face -face meeting to understand how people think, to understand the clinical challenges, and help drive those research collaborations forward. So we now have an expanded network of colleagues at Harvard, Copenhagen, BGI, and Shenzhen, all working together on multidisciplinary cancer research projects. And this is also just rewarding. It's nice to meet different people from different backgrounds. It just makes work more enjoyable, which is important. Because it accelerates our productivity. We have visits from Cornell to both Sweden, where uh, the pathology team led by Brian and uh, Professor Gudis, who moved later this week, have visited Lund and Umea. We've had colleagues from Umea and Sweden visit our collaborators in Harvard, and so forth. This has led to an expansion of activity, which has enabled us to do research projects. It's enabled us to prepare grants and secure grants. Without grants, we can't achieve anything. But our grants are stronger because we're working together. We've also examined each other's PhDs. This has enabled us to really delve into the nitty-gritty science that we're involved in, so we understand our strengths and capabilities in our different universities. So 2014, we've now had three medical undergraduates trained uh, pathology get uh, visits to pathology in Brian's team at Cornell. We've had 15 joint publications in four years. There are further seven manuscripts in preparation across all key cancer disciplines, breast, urology, kidney, and drug development. And we've secured, in just from the UK alone, funders funding from the prestige funders. And that's the signal. They value what we're doing. If we follow the money, 
It tells you whether or not the people who make key decisions actually accept and understand what you're doing. So this to us is a validation and a reward for the investment that we've made in developing those networks. The key to these are people and mobility. Uh, Dr. Blatt spent a year in our lab. This was enormously rewarding. We enjoyed having Natalia there. Not least because we had a lot of chat check, which has meant many of our lab meetings a lot of fun. We have Corinne, one of our uh, trainees, who's going to join us this week. We also had uh, other medics do PhDs with us. And this is a picture of a younger Regina back during her uh, earliest days of her PhD. We're also looking that our research team in Nottingham is very diverse, and that is a strength for us. We are able to utilize the expertise from all over the world joining our team, um, and that has facilitated and augmented our uh, networks. So I apologize if your photo is not here, it's because I couldn't find one of you online, but I acknowledge your uh, uh, contribution. I want to wrap up by talking briefly about the Nottingham Prognostic Index in breast cancer. And this is the work that's been led by Professor Ian Ellis over the last 30 years, and now is being driven by Professor Ima Braca. Both send their apologies, and they had hoped to be here for this meeting. Uh, they're currently running the International Breast Cancer Pathology Masterclass, where they teach pathologists from around the world in an intense two-week program to understand how the Nottingham Prognostic Index can be used to guide breast cancer care. But they're fully committed to our collaboration between Nottingham and Kazan. The Nottingham Prognostic Index is a way of looking at a patient's prostate uh, breast cancer tumor and helping to understand its histology, its size, to predict how it will behave. It is easy, it's reliable, it's internationally deployed. And its benefit to cancer patients is basically incalculable. It has enabled those patients who don't require intensive treatment to not have the side effects associated with intensive treatment. And it has helped identify those patients that require aggressive treatment to improve their outcomes. So the benefits are incalculable. I also wanted to show this, that this is uh, Ian Ellis's uh, PubMed record, 685 papers. This is an extraordinary career of achievement. And I want to describe how this has been achieved. Well, it started off 30 years ago, 1987. Ian started to recruit the first cohort of patients into the Nottingham Breast Cancer Study. And this is, was a cohort of 2,000 patients which were then followed up over the last 30 years. Clinical specimens were biobanked and tissue microarrays prepared prospectively and the clinical follow-up maintained scrupulously annually. Ian was able to do this by having the foresight to be integrated into a clinical multidisciplinary team, but also by recruiting in basic and translational researchers, including my colleagues uh, Alan McIntyre, Shinzia, and others. And by working together, they were able to utilize this cohort to understand how breast cancer behaves in patients. Crucially, Ian's personality and commitment has always been to collegiality. This has been one of the most important things about the team. Everybody is forced to get on well. It's demanded. You have to be part of the team. And this has enabled everybody to achieve more and better science. And it's always been patient-focused. Patients are involved in the design of the research projects. Patient engagement is very important culturally for us. And this has enabled this long-term follow-up of those first 2,000 patients. Over the last two years, they followed up with the development of a second 2,000 patients, also in TMAs, also with clinical follow-up, reflecting the changes in how breast cancer patients are managed. So this is now the largest breast cancer cohort in the world described to this level. And they're looking outwards for collaborations. So they're looking forward to visiting Kazan to see how we can work together to utilize this resource to help improve breast cancer care here. How are they doing that? Well, they have contributed to the largest genomic characterization of breast cancer, the Metabolic <coughs> Study. 
So this is multiple nature and nature genetics papers describing the histology, the genomics, the biology of the tumors. And that has really underpinned current breast cancer care management. They had the foresight to get involved in the 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK. So the UK is sequencing the genomes of 100,000 patients, 3,000 of whom have breast cancer. And a large proportion of those are not even breast cancer patients. They're also contributors to international projects to understand the genomics of triple negative breast cancers. So this reflects their commitment to not stand still. They want to constantly improve the Nottingham Prognostic Index iteratively, so as constantly addressing the current clinical need. And that is done successfully because they've gotten the buy-in of clinical multidisciplinary teams and large numbers of basic and translational researchers globally. And they're looking forward to collaborating with you in the future. So my conclusion is that essential partnerships are needed to address the challenge of cancer. We need to have multidisciplinary clinical and basic research teams, and these have to be internationally collaborative. And really, I, I was struck by, in history, when we faced existential threats, we have only been successful when Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States have worked together. We are better, and our science is better, when we work together. We only have to look up at night when we see the International Space Station go by, and that is a collaborative effort. So I find it highly rewarding and motivating to work with Albert and his teams, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, and, uh, well, Regina? It's your turn, no? Oh, Jim's here. Good morning, everybody. Um, hope you bear with me. I was not program to talk today, um, but so hopefully this will go all right, even though it might not be as well organized as I want it to be. So I'm an associate professor at the University of Nottingham. I work um, in the same place um, as uh, Nigel's, and um, I'm really privileged to be here and, and uh, uh, talking to you about some of our research. And um, so very grateful to the organizers for the invitation, but also to Nigel for having introduced it to me to one colleagues, uh, both here in Kazan and in Sweden and the US. So with whom already we have done some work with, but we hope to do more in the future. So what we'd like to do today is really present some of uh, the type of research that we do in our lab and how we have established collaborations, how these collaborations have led to nice publications, and how we think like we want to move uh, forward. So our field of research is about cancer, um, but also stem cell biology in general. And the work I'm presenting today is really about how we can target uh, cancers themselves and what are the implications for uh, precision medicine, which is the program that we would like to establish further. So for me, when I think about precision medicine, it's about identifying effective therapies, so precise medicine, uh, but targeting individual uh, uh, patients. So in cancer, we know that you know, the disease it, it, it's very complex, so it's never really straightforward, as you see it in the books. So most of the cancers are actually their own identities and entities. And um, you know, especially for solid tumors, I think there is a big challenge, which is uh, this heterogeneity and complexity about the tumor that we don't really fully still understand. And um, so, you know, many some years back, there was a kind of a breakthrough for what I'm interested in, and it was like the discovery that this heterogeneous mass of tumor contains some cells that we now call as cancer stem cells. 
Um, but essentially, nobody really un understands or agrees where these kinds of stem cells come from. But in my point of view, are uh, cells that at some point, um, depending, uh, you know, what brought there, they start to behave as a stem cell-like. Uh, uh, cells so they proliferate but they can also continue to behave like normal stem cells in a tissue so they can make like up all the different cell types so that will be in that tissue contributing to this level of heterogeneity. So this together with clonal evolution which is always like a driving force for the development of cancer um, so it's like almost like selecting the, the fittest for growth so it makes this kind of you know tumor very hard to treat and, um, and to eliminate from the body. So this is cancer stem cells, therefore, um, you know, are at the basis of one of the biggest hurdles for precision medicine, which is about finding um, targeted therapy, effective therapies, and uh, also for individual patients, because now we understand that most of the solid tumors vary basically from patient to patient. So our lab really uh, is focusing how these cells become cancers, and we want to understand if there is a mechanism by which we can er eradicate them, or to identify them very early on so that we can make a better prognostic, basically, decisions about cancer treatment. And uh, what we are interested in is really this kind of switch, what makes the stem cells grow from normal to cancer, and we're focusing mainly on epigenetic and genetic mechanisms that drive this, this, this change. So I'm, only, I'm, I'm really highlighting some of the studies like to give you a big picture, so I'm not really spending a lot of time talking about the numbers or you know, the, the, the genes that you see in the slides, but hopefully I'll give you some, just, just a very a snapshot of the type of science that we, that we do, so hopefully we'll facilitate further discussion later on to see whether we can help to establish this uh, uh, collaborative effort. So for example, here in this slide, to highlight a study that we have um, completed not long time ago, um, and uh, for which like, both Jenny and Nigel have uh, contributed. And it's really about identifying a class of genes and their involvement in this kind of switch that I mentioned about uh, stem cells. So we uh, really like uh, homobox genes or ROX genes because they are master regulators of stem cell behavior. So as you can see at the top, they regulate lots of the mechanisms that stem cells do in a normal uh, physiological conditions. But when these go um, uh, wrong, they obviously can drive cancer. So this, uh, the work that is done by Mansisha, one of my uh, postgrad students in the lab. So we have done uh, like a molecular characterization of the different subtypes of breast cancers. So breast cancer is a complex disease. So there are many different subtypes um, that have been uh, recognized and they all behave differently and for which we use different type of treatments. So understanding more about those will give us this kind of me uh, precision medicine approach uh, for treatment. And we have identified a very interesting gene which is OXYC8, uh, here highlighted which is uh, down-regulated in uh, uh, all the different cancer subtypes. And we were very interested in it because one thing that many cancer biologists are really dreaming of is to find a, like, uh, um, you know, a very novel tumor suppressor gene that can actually make the trick to, you know, to uh, fight uh, breast cancer. So what we've been able to do is to show that um, ox gene um, generally are epigenetically regulated. So ox C8 is switched off in, uh, in cancer due to an epigenetic mechanism. Um, so, you know, even though I show the data, we can talk about more these techniques and what they mean, you know, later on if you're interested in. So, uh, one is um, silence in the normal cells, what uh, drives basically cancer stem cell proliferation, so increased tumorogenicity. And as you can see here, for example, from this stem cell, the, you know, grow uh, up more than the normal here. But then when you re-express the cancer cells, the cells uh, instead, you know, the cancer stem cells don't proliferate and they tend to die and also tend to also differentiate the response to retinoic acid, which is a very simple drug that's been really interesting for many years in the clinic, but it's almost like neglected now as a therapeutic option because obviously, you know, pharmaceutical industry are looking for something much more refined and better, but I think there's still value, you know, in. Uh, in classical therapies, uh, in my in my you know, opinion. 
Um, so what we're doing now is we want to understand my, more how this OXACI8 work and you know, so for example we have done RNA sequencing in the lab, identified some interesting pathways, this is uh, the work of uh, Corinne which is sitting here in the audience. And what we're doing now with the um, uh, Dr. Persson in uh, Sweden is to, uh, and, and the colleagues at, at Nottingham, that Nigel just mentioned, the, the pathology group in the breast cancer, is to uh, stay in um, tissue migrant rate of patients and try to establish whether this is a very good uh, you know, um, biomarker basically for, for, um, for breast cancer. Also, uh, we have another project which is just just started. This is Jessica, um, a new postgraduate in the lab. So we are trying to modeling how these ox genes could be uh, involved, for example, in dormancy and cancer recurrence. We are particularly interested in R2 and ER positive cancers because these are the ones that is a you know kind of bottleneck for the patients because they always don't know when the cancer is gone, how long did they have a clear of cancer. So you know for them. Uh, and the quality of life is very important to know. And so we model these in a 3D sort of environment where we um, switch the cells in different uh, kind of stiffness of, of conditions to grow and we uh, look like the switch from dormant to proliferation and how oxygen participate on this. So one thing I wanted to highlight, we do really basic science and like fundamental questions, but we try to address questions which are really relevant for patients. Because I think, you know, that, yeah, I do believe, as uh, Professor, um, you know, Albert mentioned, that we should really link um, all the basic science to the clinic as much as possible. Another uh, type of research that we are uh, involved in is to look at um, always focusing on epigenetic mechanisms, how we can erase the dose. So, you know, an interesting concept, I think, you know, lots of the precision medicine goes from characterizing all the mutation, all the characteristics of individual patients, but just to understand this kind of diversity. But we are also interested in a kind of um, different approach. So if we, you know, start from the cancer and you can make go away all these, you know, um, alterations that characterize the cancer, and uh, by establishing some kind of control in this kind of weird network that goes on in cancer, can we end up with the normal cell cells, 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 you know, um, cells back? So in other words, you know, the, all, the, all the classical approach to therapy to cancer is always to eliminate the cancer burden. But you know, if you would think like cancer as something that could become a chronic condition where a patient can live with it and can be you know, manageable, this could be maybe, maybe some, a, a different type of approach, but equally um, effective. So we do this basically by trying to reverse this kind of status, cancer state of the cells, you know, the cells in diff with different mechanisms. And the approach that we use is either by reprogramming the cells, so we're using oocyte extracts, um, or by IPS technology, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. So the reason why we have adopted this kind of weird system is because there is a lot of mystery behind the choose of this model. We use um, Axolotl, so which is um, a, a basic salamander model, uh, because it's got um, many um, regeneration capacities. So these animals can even regrow their brain. So at the level of regenerative medicine is a, a unique and, and amazing um, you know, a model. And so we have found about comparing, comparing different type of all sites um, and in different species that this model is the most effective. Um, and the reason why we use all sites because obviously in terms of reprogramming, um, for those of you in the audience that have an interest in stem cells, the all site can do this every day when it gets fertilized. So it's the master reprogramming uh, cell in the body. And so we, we have shown that, that we can um, reprogram the cancer cells to have this kind of um, still, you know, be able to make tumors in mice, but they're uh, basically frozen in time, so they don't really develop farther. And this, you know, kind of intrigued us a lot because we thought that by knowing how this happens, we can understand the, like, the mechanism that goes behind the, the tumors in the first place. And so lately we have done some more work on this, and this is um, uh, Lina, um, another postgraduate student in the lab, where we have been able to find out what are the mechanisms behind this, which is just, just summarized here. But basically when this reprogramming goes, and this is for ER-positive breast cancer, we have reactivation of RB, 
which is dependent from uh, some fundamental epigenetic reprogramming first. Uh, this is the epigenetic reprogramming is essential for this to happen. And so, uh, you know, lots of other things going on, but basically uh, what happens is the cells, uh, they don't die, they become dormant, and in our hands, at least in the mouse model, we can maintain this up to almost like um, six months time without any further progression, which is an interesting um, prospect. Um, so current project is really we would like to extend this type of research to other cancer types that maybe don't depend as much from RB to, so, to see whether this is uh, still valuable. So for example, we have done some preliminary work on triple negative breast cancer. We still did see difference, but in growth. So for example, uh, this is like the untreated and treated mice. Um, you know, they, when I showed this to the clinician, they said, oh, but this is wonderful, it's better than dos dosidaxel or, you know, current like, therapies, so it's still, it's still, you know, I didn't think that it was very impressive, but, yeah, th that's why we need clinicians, you know, to work with you. Um, so we are also um, testing other sorts of extracts, including sturgeon extract, which is another uh, fascination of um, one of my colleagues that works in evolutionary biology. And also we're trying to now refine this sort of you know, uh, approach because we do realize that, especially for commercial application, the use of an extra might not be you know, as attractive. So and just to highlight that we want to establish like, a fiber system in collaboration with other developmental biologists here, not in our based on a zebrafish transplantation model instead of you know, to refine and reduce the use of mice. And uh, I said that another, another area would be, you know, based on this model of our program with through IPS, because with IPS technology is essentially another method that you can reprogram the cells. So we are uh, trying to develop model of carcinogenesis by inducing mutation in breast cancer cells and then um, making IPS out of those and re-differentiate them and try to model the progression of the disease. So far we have done this for um, uh, breast cancer, they have a PI, um, uh, sorry, K3CA mutation, which is a very common uh, type of mutation in ER positive uh, breast cancer, but we also have data for uh, a double mutant with P53. So it is possible you know, to do this kind of work. So this is um, um, like a mammary differentiation in vitro uh, model. And, and then we tested the tumorogenesis, at least you know, in vitro. I know that this is a bit busy, but uh, basically what we, um, what we see is that there is a reacquisition of tumorogenesis after differentiation, which gives uh, like a window of time to study the contribution of the mutation to the tumorogenesis process. Um, and then switching a bit because I'm cautious of time. So we work mainly with breast cancer, but another parallel uh, type of work that we do is focusing on testicular cancer. This is more recent. And so we, um, I, I, I'm very fortunate to um, work and be married to <laughs> the guy that is up there. So that's my husband. We met, uh, um, you know, through work and it's been yeah, a, a life-changing experience, I suppose, in the US. Um, so I've been really lucky to be involved in a, in a really nice study where basically um, we have been able to show the mechanisms involved and the pathways involved in early germ cell um, development um, using a, a pig uh, model, um, embry embryonic model, um, which mirrors very, very closely you know, the human development. In, uh, this is a, a, a kind of um, a field that is, that is almost impossible to study in humans because at the time where the germ cells, the primordial germ cells, which are the precursors from sperm and oocytes, are developed basically in, uh, in, in, in a human body, it's before uh, implantation, so we can't really have access embryos at that, uh, at that stage because pregnant women that miscarry, for example, they wouldn't even know basically they're pregnant at that time. So it's very, very difficult to obtain uh, you know, samples at that stage, but using this big model, um, it's, it's been you know, really, really good, and we've been able to dissect out all the molecular mechanisms that go and, and are involved in this um, type of development. And most importantly, found out that the development is very different in boson in mouse, okay? And the mouse model is what is used by many scientists around the world, you know, to study these kind of questions. 
By using this knowledge, basically, we're trying to uh, apply this for in vitro uh, production of gametes, uh, but also uh, the basis of germ cell tumor development, which is what interests me. And we've been doing some uh, work together with Nigel. This is uh, Ryan in, in the lab. And so he's been focusing on the role of this gene that is a key gene, a master regulator for both stem cell and primordial germ cell development, which is called nano. So we find that this nano is um, always kind of, you know, uh, or a, a bit of a chromosome that contains also nano, but is selectively enriched in germ cell tumors. Um, for some kind of uh, advantageous mechanisms that you know, it provides. And then um, what we're trying to do is to see whether this uh, gene nano can, uh, to, um, can uh, regulate the expression of uh, microRNA that are involved in stem cell proliferation in these tumors. So we've been able to show uh, by um, analyzing um, existing NHS patient data that this is, might be the case. So we can model this in vitro. And uh, after the sequencing, because we find that uh, near 9 is uh, downregulated after a nano binds to its promoter, that there's some interesting targets that could be used for biomarkers for um, germ cell tumors so that we would like to, you know, to slow further. On the same line, we also have another project with a uh, man in the lab that looks at peewee RNA. So this is another class of uh, non-coding RNA that is um, uh, they're important for germ cell development because they silence the rate of rascosome, so those bits of the genomes that can jump and create lots of genomic instability that you really don't want in the germ line. And uh, it's a complex project, but basically we've been, um, um, sorry, we've been um, uh, reanalyzing TCGA data, and this is uh, Nadja's work, <laughs> bioinformatic magic work, um, uh, from scratch, because the kiwi, they were not um, annotated, so there's like about 150 patients, and we've been able to pinpoint uh, some nice candidates that we would like to uh, study further, it would be the focus of the next two years in this project. So just to summarize, then just I just wanted to put up this as a as a like recap of what we do and what we think like uh, would be a nice opportunity for collaboration and also training opportunities in our lab. So essentially, what we do is really work with stem cells. So we have uh, different models, lots of in vitro models, 3D models. So we can isolate the stem cells. And I worked many years with embryonic stem cells, so our, our lab is geared up to do lots of you know, things with them. So we also have this field of epigenetic reprogramming and IPS. Um, so we can obviously apply these things also to normal stem cells, so we still have an uh, interest in regenerative medicine. In collaboration with people at the hospital, we have uh, access to xenograft and hopefully also to zebrafish uh, transplantation models. At the molecular level, we do gene expression um, um, you know, analysis, and we're lucky to collaborate with bioinformaticians that can help us you know, to make sense of them. So we can do epigenetic analysis, both at gene level or genome-wide, and um, recently we're more into the CRISPR kind of field, so we have a bit of experience with that. Um, so just to highlight, you know, we have contributed to uh, successful collaborations in this network that we are presenting today. So nice publications came out of it. I was very fortunate, you know, to be involved with those. And I think we can do more of this if we work together. And, you know, hopefully we will do that in the future. And just to acknowledge all the people that contributed or are contributing to this um, kind of work. Um, so. These are the people in the lab, but I already mentioned Nigel ma many times, and Vicky James um, is another colleague of ours that is cannot but be here, but she's um, uh, new, to, new to, the, to the school, but yeah, we're doing more stuff with her. People at the university and the pathology group, um, I mentioned already Ramiro and Andrew Johnson, Martin Gary, they are helping with the um, salamander and fish model. Jenny has been really supportive and you know, very interested in the research so far. And also um, Regina and Albert that have met already in Nottingham and have been um, initially involved in some discussions for further collaborations. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.
you very much. Thank and this is oh, wait, 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 wait. and this is the scientific part actually of our uh, meeting. So if anybody have any questions, we have time for uh, a few questions and discussion. And maybe I can open this uh, uh, question and answer session. Uh, how do you uh, deliver uh, on-site extracts to the mouse model? Okay, so what we do, we never treated the tumors when they are in the mouse. So what we do, and it's actually amazing they work, so, so we treat the cells first in, in the dish, and you need to permeabilize the cells both at the um, cellular membrane and nuclear membrane, because epigenetic remodeling you know, is important, and, and we know that there is uh, chaperones and traffic between the nucleus and, and the extra proteins. Um, and then once the cells are treated, they are recovered overnight, so to make the membranes reseal, and then we transplant those into the mice. So the actual tumors in the mice are never treated. So all of this kind of change or development goes on in six hours, which is you know, amazing to believe that you know, that can actually last. Um, but there is a publication from a different group um, kind of, you know, small journal where they have been able to inject um, the uh, bioelectroporation um, extract, in this case was Xenoplus, that we know that works, but, you know, I know as good as the Axolotl, directly to uh, melanoma tumors grown in mouse. Um, so it could be a possibility. But in our case, we never try to do that because our aim was really to start the fundamentals and we want to understand the mechanism of that because we know that commercially, you know, the idea of injecting an undefined soup, you know, in, in a patient would be always impossible to achieve. So I think the way that we move forward is we want to characterize the molecules, a cocktail, you know, molecules without the extract and then just refine and work with the specific molecules and avoid the extract altogether. Might not be, you know, it sounds very easy, but it's actually not. So we might not be able to achieve that. But, or at least, you know, like purified protein extract, you know, some kind which is um, maybe a you know, clinical grade protein extract, I don't know as yet. But ideally it would be like the fine, you know, cocktail that you can put together. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Here, 
for your university at, at Kazan or Nottingham or wherever else you are to try to develop programs that uh, would fit your sort of setting as you're in, your patients. So as I mentioned, um, and it does, I think, as the, as the vice rector said in his opening, is sort of like figuring out sort of what precision medicine is, is part of why we're here today and what moves it forward. And uh, when I first started hearing the term precision medicine or first science medicine, I was a little, a little taken aback by it because I thought that's what we did every day as doctors. You know, we have a patient in front of us, we see what their problems are, and we give them medication to treat their disease. So in some ways, precision medicine or first science medicine has been around for decades. It's just that we want to move to the next level, so it actually is based upon an individual patient's uh, characteristics and not just data that's been iterative over multiple trials and group efforts to get down to at least a group of patients that benefit. And so our thinking now is that you know we want to give the right treatment uh, for the right patient at the right time. Knowing, especially with cancer therapies, that they, they may ultimately need multiple rounds of therapy. And so you know, or, ordering the treatments is important. And the more information we have to be able to do that, um, a lot of work uh, went into the genomics aspects to understand that. Now we're moving on to the transcriptomics, um, manipulation work, epigenetics. Uh, it's going to be important for that. And so the overall vision um, at, at our institute, the England Institute at Cornell, is you know, to make it a collaborative effort. So we're not just within groups at our own institution, but also at institutions like Kazan, Nottingham, Lund, Umia, um, to accelerate the understanding of disease through things like genome you know, sequencing, as well as uh, any new technologies that are coming out available, and apply it to improve patient care. So while on any individual patient, the goal is to help that to do a patient, the overall goal is still to take that information and make it more, more useful to the population as a whole. And that will get into sort of the research arm of precision medicine that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, again, I, I, I have to say I apologize if you have to hear me for three times. Uh, my colleagues at Cornell really wanted to be here, but for a variety of reasons could not. And so didn't want to deprive you of information, so I, I took the liberty of, of speaking a few different occasions uh, about what's going on. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the precision medicine and personalized medicine thought um, five years ago even was more that you have a drug that treats patients um, with a certain mutation and you get this great response. That was the idea um, just five years ago. Is that sort of like you have one drug, one target, and then do great. And that's still the case. But we also know there's a lot more that goes into it than just uh, single gene sequencing like EGFR in the beginning or KRS mutations. Um, we also now look at you know, the RNA and protein expression levels, which is what drives the cell, um, ultimately. The microenvironment and the immune contexture of the cell. So with the immunotherapeutics that came out, PDL1 status, you know, that's, that's often you know, in non-pulmonary cancers, not on the tumor cells, but on the immune cells that are around it, which if you do genomic sequencing for tumor cell mutations, you're not going to find that. Um, we also know that you know, for a long time now, there are certain germline variants, and if patients respond better or worse to certain drugs based upon you know, your non-coding mutations. And so there's a lot more that goes into precision medicine now than just even five or ten years ago where you have a gene that relates to a drug. And so if you have a schematic that sort of looks at the typical way a, a doctor or oncologist would look at patient care is you, know, you have your medical history, you do your exam, you do a blood test, you do the next rays, you send off a biopsy to pathology, we could do diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, and then you go into these groups of various treatments based upon the clinical trials and literature that's out there. And sometimes you get responses, sometimes you don't. If you don't get a response, you try the next drug. But what we ultimately want and have developed at, at Cornell for our Institute of Medicine is that the biopsy will give you a diagnosis that puts you into a general broad category of adenocarcinoma or splenosal carcinoma. But we also now submit that specimen for next generation sequencing, computation biologic analyses, we bank those samples for future research so that when new tests and new models come out, we can actually go back to the samples and see if there's new um, treatments for the patient. But ultimately, we get the results of that next generation sequencing. We meet in a tumor board setting, as I mentioned earlier, these tumor boards for our precision medicine are uh, attended by basic scientists as well as clinicians and uh, sort of more translational researchers like myself. Um, so that we all stay abreast of what's coming down the pipeline, pipeline what's needed, and what's, what's uh, the direction is of treatments going. Um, and so that ultimately, the, the clinicians leave with the treatment plan 
that's more specialized to an individual patient based upon the genomics and computational work. And the researchers leave with an idea of what can I do in the laboratory that's going to ultimately bring in new treatments for these patients who don't respond initially or who have a, a unique mutational uh, landscape. And so, you know, there's a variety of groups that make this work. These are sort of the, the, the five broad swaths of, of researchers and clinicians that we have that I think make our, our team successful. Um, and being that it's all patient-directed, patient-centered, is, you know, the first and foremost is the clinic team. So we want them to be involved and engaged with the patients so that they are, the patients are excited about patient medicine. They want to contribute to not only their own care and treatment, but also to the research efforts of the institution by providing um, their consents and their samples for research purposes. Um, we have our genomics laboratory. Um, well, I guess by going through the workflow, it sort of runs in a counterclockwise fashion or somewhat time fashion. But the clinic team will the patients. The pathology team, which I'm a part of, is going to be what uh, makes sure that the specimens have uh, the most usefulness to their lives. Um, and I have a, another talk after the break, which I'll go into that a little bit. Um, but we help make sure that the specimens are triaged in a way that the most information can be achieved from those samples. Um, generally, generally, part of that will involve some next generation sequencing on a various scale. Um, and that will be run by the genomics laboratory, who then provide those uh, genomic sequencing results to the computational biology team, which uh, are always a mystery to me how much they can get out of this series of four letters that are given to them. And then the research arm, uh, the functional validation team, as we call them, are the ones who um, take that information, those novel discoveries, implement them into organoids, cell lines, mouse models, xenographs, and uh, apply a host of high throughput drug screening to those to sort of understand the biology, the treatment options, um, and what's sort of going to happen next, potentially with this patient and the field in general. And so there's a sort of a, a circle of, um, of of uh, clinicians and researchers that are, uh, revolve around the patient again as a single sort of source and goal of targeting therapy. But then off to the side, all the years working together are more numerous than I can go through right now. Um, from the computational team, as I mentioned before, the tumor board discussions that we have, the working groups that spin off of those, those tumor boards to talk about novel projects for, for, for new cancer treatments or therapies or, or discoveries. The seminars that are invited in from outside that you're having now here at Kazan to bring in new, new life. And so all of those things will ultimately lead into sort of educational initiatives that go back to the patient to help them understand their disease, um, as well as you know, partly to excite um, their, their friends and their families who ultimately, um, and unfortunately, will need treatment to also participate in these kinds of programs that are going to advance science. So um, since 2013, when the Institute was founded, um, the New York State, where our laboratory is located, approved the test for clinical use in 2015. So in just the last three years, we've sequenced over 1,000 uh, exomes at our institution for clinical patients um, from a variety of cancers. And um, what uh, I will say is that part of any process, as I'm sure you're aware, um, is the important part is communications in all of these steps and processes. Um, and also developing you know, your protocols and your basic scientist so this becomes second nature to you to have laboratory ma manuals and methods and protocols in place. And it is for me too as a pathologist. But surprisingly, um, oncologists and surgeons are not that sort of great about following sort of algorithmic approaches to, to patients and samples. And so, um, it's always good to have a line of communication open in both directions and so that everyone's on the same page when you want to know sort of what's going to happen from patient enrollment to sample uh, processing and result sort of, re, uh, sort of result reveal to the patients. So um, a lot of it is working with communications and managing expectations as in any large organization. Um, so uh, the sort of basic workflow that we have um, that we've inflated is again sort of the patient at the center over here sees a clinician with or without a previous diagnosis of cancer. Um, and if they have cancer or suspect cancer, they undergo either biopsy or surgery. And at that time, 
the clinician will, will order a test. And as I will talk about again after the break, the test they order may or may not be known at the time, and we try to process the specimen in a way that preserves that. But for the sake of this particular talk, we'll say that they order an exome sequencing test um, because the patient is known to have cancer and they have metastases. So it goes to a laboratory, gets processed, uses germline blood as controls. Um, they get their analyses back after going through a, a, this process workflow, which is all uh, electronically managed um, from the registration patient into our electronic medical record system to the sample collection, extraction, sequencing analysis, which is all followed using um, our, our REDCap system, which is an online system. There's a dashboard tracker along the entire way that allows tracking the specimen from beginning to end. And ultimately, the patient um, and the, the clinician receive a report back that is discussed at the tumor board and the patient ultimately decides upon uh, next steps. As I mentioned before, there's a computational pipeline that is quite extensive at our institute and I, I'm very uh, happy that they're there to help me understand everything, but they developed their own mutational database that's available online. Um, I'll point that out a little bit later. But um, there's also a variety of checks that are in place to make sure that you know, the samples are accurate, that there's a good clonality analysis that's going on to let us know sort of the purity of the samples. So um, again, sort of going back to the 182 that Tinji brought up and, and Nigel, it's important. Um, and we also use the same uh, CBIO portal that's available from, um, from the uh, US government to visualize our results internally as well. So it's a, a uniform process so that researchers and clinicians both are used to looking at results in the same way, which allows for easier discussions between the two and the same room. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, we have dashboards developed electronically for the patients and the admin staff and the doctors to follow on the specimens. And so um, everyone uh, can even, I think, uh, yeah, even on their iPads and iPhones can check the status of the sample. They can see where it is, you know, roughly how many days it's been in, in, in processing, how many days are left, um, which is very helpful. And it's, it's also been useful for us to help decrease our turnaround time. So initially, when the test was opened in 2015, I think it was around um, almost uh, four or five months for an actual clinical result to come back, which obviously is not going to be that helpful for patients who are in desperate need of a treatment. Um, but now we got that down to around 30 days, I think, for most samples. Um, if you look at uh, sort of non-exome-based, more broad genomic testings that are offered like foundation medicine, those are usually on the order of 10 to 15 days. And so not much longer than that, and we give you um, much more information than you can get from that test alone. So the reports that we generate, again, are, are electronic reports put into the patient's medical record. Um, they include some nice, beautiful images from pathology, as well as a summary of the results in um, a tiered aspect of what genes are actionable, what are cancer-specific, but not necessarily relevant for treatment, or at least no known treatments exist. And then those, which is the most numerous category, mutations that we have no idea what they do, and we may never know. Um, and then the subsequent pages go into what are those specific mutations that were found, um, were there cognitive alterations, are, are there genomic alterations that have no significance present, and ultimately, um, there's also a component of the report that I'm not showing here that talks about the clinical trials that are out there and available for the patients. If there, uh, we also just recently got permissions to start reporting germline results, which is always a little bit of a tricky subject in the United States. Um, but uh, we do have the permission to report germline codes, so if we find a BRCA mutation, for instance, we can report that out to the patient as well. And then also, if there's a you know organoid development from that patient that was accepted, then we also provide a functional report with certain sort of uh, drug screens that were uh, performed. Um, this is the, the knowledge base that we've developed, and so uh, on the one hand, there's a variety of these out there and available. This is just another tool that you can have at your, at your disposal to use. It's publicly available, um, but we also wanted to develop our own so we can be more nimble to make on-the-fly changes about new discoveries and technologies um, surrounding or new drug treatments surrounding different uh, genes, variants, and tissue types, which are all listed there. And so the website is listed there. Um, it lists sort of all the different mutations that are out there, cosmic IDs, as well as to some extent when they're present, the interpretations that we use in our reports about what that mutation means for specific tumor types, specific patients. Um, so this is a tool that's come very, you know, that, that is helpful to our computational biologists when making their reports, 
to the clinician, to the reading reports, and even to patients who want to know more about their disease and what might happen or what's, what the options are for them. So currently, um, the workflow in our approved laboratory is patients undergo um, biopsies that are sequenced and these reports back. Well, it's ultimately the pipeline that we want to provide clinical results for, which uh, given the, the bureaucracy and regulations has taken a little bit longer than we had liked, but we're, we're almost there to start to do more clinical reporting of these organoids and drug screens that are out there and available. And I'll talk more about this tomorrow with the research arm. But ultimately, we want to have an even broader sort of scope for our patients of what's possible with their, with their tissues and samples. Um, the current status that we have, or it's current uh, program that I mentioned, are, are very tier, tiered. And it sort of goes along with the fact that not only is the tumor itself sort of heterogeneous, but also the samples we get for processing are going to be heterogeneous. Anything from uh, a few cells from a needle aspirate to an entire organ resection. And what you do with those is going to depend upon how much tumor you have. So we have sort of four, four panels of, of, of genomic sequencing available. Um, we have a very targeted sample, uh, which essentially covers only those genes with, with known sort of drug responses or outcome that are relevant for treatment. Um, this provides very, very high coverage, so a lot of, a lot of depth. You're not, you're not going to miss a mutation in a small sample of a few tumor cells, and you're going to get the genes you need for current treatment strategies. Um, we have a more intermediate panel um, that was just approved that has a broader list of DNA mutations and cognitive alterations and also some RNA fusions on it as well. Um, and then there's ultimately the whole exome sequencing, our exact one test as we call it, which is going to give you everything um, at a lower depth. Um, and we're currently on target for another 500 samples this year. And then we also have a fourth sort of panel of testing because hematologic malignancies are so unique in the number of chromosomal aberrations, mutations that are there, fusions that are present. And so we have a very targeted panel that's specifically just for myeloid and hematopoietic neoplasms. Um, which almost you know, never sort of overlap with the solid tumors that genes are interested in. So as I mentioned, our laboratory space is accredited by New York State, um, and we have uh, sort of top of the line equipment and techs who are very, very uh, knowledgeable and dedicated, which are always extremely helpful and, and important in any laboratory process. The system we use is easy for the patients to get enrolled. As I mentioned, the clinicians you use, you want, you know, if you want something to be utilized, it's going to be easy for the user to access it. And so the same systems that the clinicians use in order to put in their notes for patient visit is the same system they use to request exome sequencing or any other molecular testing on a sample. So the same orders that are put in for routine biopsy analysis for pathology is the same system that gets the that system used for them to order the exome sequencing test. Um, the results also, as I mentioned, go back into electronic records, so there's no sort of um, uh, need to look around using a system to find the results. They're going to be right there for you at your fingertips. And as I mentioned, these tumor boards are multidisciplinary, and truly multidisciplinary, in that it's not just disciplines of medicine, such as oncology and surgery, pathology, but also disciplines of the basic science arms as well, from pharmacology um, to the computational biologist um, to cell biology. So a little bit more sort of information about the, the results of the test and what we've learned from our first few years in, in practice. Um, is that you know we really need to tier our tests based upon the samples that are available and what the questions are going to be. Um, we've also learned that um, we can improve upon our exact one exome sequencing based test. And so after only just you know, a few years in, 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 um, in use, we're about ready to release the exact two model, I think, later this year, which has um, an enhanced sort of primer set for deeper coverage of the most uh, useful genes in medicine. We found over time that just a general pan exome uh, uh, testing model um, was unable to detect some important sort of EGFR and KRAS mutations. So enriching the, the primer sets that we use to get deeper coverage for select genes or these select exons is going to be important for our clinical testing and our clinicians' needs. We don't want to have 
have them need to request two tests, one small test for deep, deep sequencing and one broad test for um, uh, more extended discovery, but we want to have one test that does everything, and so that enrichment for deeper coverage of a target set of genes was important for us. And for our researchers, um, they were more interested in uh, understanding more about the role of viruses in tumor development, and so we actually put in some viral genomes into the exact two assays set to be able to detect those and the presence of those in tumors, as well as an increase in the number of detections or ease of detection for gene fusions. So the clinical laboratories um, for our targeted panel of solid tumors, which is used for patients with first-time diagnoses of cancer, um, runs up those 50 genes. We do um, over a thousand of those a year. Um, about half the samples are lung cancers, um, and that's because of the uh, NCI cancer guidelines, almost you know, essentially dictating for lung cancers the need for tar for genome sequencing at time of diagnosis to be able to select which therapies the patients are going to respond to or not. Um, excuse me. Um, our exact one exome sequencing test since our, its inception has been limited, or, or not limited, but focused more on metastatic patients. So those who uh, oftentimes have already failed prior therapies, who have already gone, undergone a targeted sequencing of a limited panel, and we're now looking for more targets that are sort of new or novel to be able to treat those patients with. Um, and we're now uh, just in the first half of the year alone um, at 250 samples this year, so ultimately we're trying to reach a 500 patients a year goal of exome sequencing. And again, these are patients who either have metastases or who are at very high risk of developing metastases soon after their surgery. Um, as I mentioned before, if you want to have a successful test, you want it to be easy to use and results easy to understand. And so, so far we've been able to get um, now over 100 clinicians who are trained and on board with submitting samples to us for exome sequencing. Um, uh, for me, as a, as a prostate pathologist, I'm lucky in that the oncologists who are the most uh, on board with this testing are geo-oncologists. And so you can see about half of our samples that are submitted to us are of uh, urologic malignancies like bladder and prostate. But we have a growing arm of of clinicians who are interested in uh, uh, gastrointestinal malignancies as well as brain tumors. So as I mentioned, the ordering is there and the consent form of the patient signed to the test also allows them, allows us to utilize their samples for all the other discovery methods that are going to be important for bringing new treatments back to the, to the, the clinic. Um, this is an example, again, of our own internal CBIO portal. If you, you're used to or are familiar with this as a researcher, you'll see that it looks no different than the one you use uh, externally for um, analyses. And uh, the results are always displayed in a similar fashion. So what we found from our first few years is that in our metastatic samples, um, probably not surprisingly, even more recent literature out there, is that the exome sequencing patients have a very high prevalence of germline DNA repair mechanisms, which um, was, uh, has been known to impart aggressive behavior on primary tumors, but this just further validates what we have seen more in the, in the literature come out recently, is that these patients really do have the most aggressive forms of disease. And in fact, for instance, you know, of our metastatic breast cancer that we se sequenced, almost a quarter of them have a germline DNA repair mechanism alteration, and it may not just be in bracket two, but bracket one or bracket two, but even others, including sort of, um, we've identified even some Lynch syndrome mutation in breast cancer patients with metastases, um, 18 mutations, anything that alters the DNA repair mechanisms um, has been um, really sort of significantly um, surprising, I think, for us to see this. Um, including 15% you know, of prostate cancers that are metastatic and even 12% of lung cancers. And so it's really uh, quite interesting and I think it's very important given the, the role of immunotherapeutic agents for, for DNA repair mechanisms as well as um, heart inhibitors. Another thing that we found very interesting um, and the contingent incidental heterogeneity aspect of it is that tumors really are uh, between patients, definitely different, and even within the same patient, extremely different. So looking at just a, a series of, of bladder cancers with metastases, we found that the metastases are often not like a primary tumor at all, which is why we and our clinicians are very adamant about making sure that patients undergo a biopsy at the time of metastasis, 
you know, if we only have the primary tumor to rely on, um, just based upon a large primary tumor, you're going to potentially be missing a lot of mutations, and you may miss the ones that are important for metastases to have developed and need to be treated. So if you look at just a, a small sort of a, a small section of the large primary tumor, um, we found that those often are very, very different and almost look nothing like the metastases that develop in those tumors because of the heterogeneity in the primary samples that gets enriched in the metastases, which is what you're trying to treat. And so we are um, very sort of big proponents of biopsying metastatic lesions for sequencing purposes and potentially even biopsying multiple metastatic sites because as, I, as you see here, we've seen a lot of, of uh, divergence in even metastases. Um, and so you never know uh, potentially which ones are going to respond and not respond. And again, from this sort of study, what we, what we see is that in the uh, majority of sort of the SNPs that, that are found um, in metastatic samples are oftentimes private just to the metastatic sample alone. These are metastases over here, these are primaries over here. So the primary tumors, yes, you can see a lot of shared mutations within the primary tumors, but the ones that metastasize are often very much unlike the primaries themselves. Um, and so this is why we had this, uh, this, this growth of multiple tissue specimens from multiple patients. So, you know, for this year alone, um, we're expecting to see about 500 uh, patients in the clinic, but we're going to see around 2,500 samples from them because we, uh, as I mentioned, we know that there's a lot of variety in the with different sites of disease and in the primary themselves. And so we will look at those differences and see what's driving the different mutations or different metastases. So, and this, um, you know, our, our goal ultimately is to improve our understanding and classification of diseases. As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, we've always been practicing sort of personalized medicine because the patient comes in, we examine them, we treat them based on prior knowledge. But now the goal is to be able to even more personalize that um, to the patient. And even though it's maybe specific to that particular patient at the time, their results will also go back always in aggregate for oppositional studies to allow further refinement of treatment options. And that's ultimately the goal of our precision medicine program. So this is um, our newest research building where the institute is, is housed. And I'd invite any of you to come visit us in New York if you're around. Hopefully Albert and the team will be there for conference in the near future. Um, I think we're, uh, I prepared Albert um, just a sample to report presentation of, 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 of a patient's sort of trajectory and, and results to report discussion. If we're running a little early, do mind if I just go yes, ahead and show us that? Okay, to sort of illustrate the types of discussions and, and results that are shown um, at our conferences and, and how sort of these new and uh, under, um, treatment options are available and used in patients with a uh, great response. So for instance, this is an actual tumor board case I took from one of our fellows that presented it. Um, and this was a patient of Dr. Nanis's who has a really interesting history. Um, because he was diagnosed 10 years ago with small cell carcinoma of the bladder, which you know, typically is a death sentence within a few months. Um, small cell carcinoma of the bladder is just like that in the lung or anywhere else, so it's very aggressive and usually not responsive to treatment. But in this particular case, this patient was treated um, with a platinum-based therapy and took aside and radiation therapy at uh, our neighbor who works on Kettering and had a, a great response. Um, so to the point where he had no residual disease, but then a year later, he developed with re developed recurrence. And this time, it's just more of a classical low-grade urethelial carcinoma. Nothing really that's going to be life-threatening. Treated locally with chemotherapy in the bladder, and then it was continued to be followed. A year later, in 2010, he had a high-grade urethelial carcinoma with invasion. So treated more aggressively with a round of BCG immunotherapy in the bladder, and then did fine for another three years until he was found to have another uh, invasive high-grade papillary urethelial carcinoma. So at that time, he also showed a tumor in his renal pelvis and ureter. He failed multiple rounds of therapies over a few years, and so they felt the best treatment for him was going to be a more aggressive surgery. And so they underwent uh, cystectomy and nephrourectomy um, removal, essentially of the right side of his inner urinary system and entire bladder. And at resection, he had no residual invasive disease, but a mixture of high-grade and low-grade tumors. A year later, um, 
He was fine on CT scan. Years went by, he did well. And then two years ago, he had a lung mass that was detected, um, as well as multiple liver metastases and enlarged retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So a little bit of an unusual course of disease for urethelial carcinoma. Um, lucky for him that he was able to survive it this far, but now it's spread beyond his urinary system uh, into his lungs. And so this is an example of the lung mass that was seen on a CT scan. Um, not a radiologist, but if I remember correctly, peripheral lesions in the lung, usually new metastases, especially if they're pleural based. And so we actually underwent a biopsy to confirm that it was not a primary lung cancer. I'm sure this patient, um, I think we correctly had a history of smoking, so at risk for bladder cancer and lung cancer, so you never know. But the biopsy did show metastatic urethelial carcinoma. Um, at that time, he was started on immunotherapy with atuzolizumab and um, didn't help him. So he CT scans showed increasing size in lung nodules as well as um, increasing hepatic nodules as well as um, respiratory adenopathy. And so at that time, he underwent a biopsy of his liver to obtain tissue for our clinical exact one test and undergo exome sequencing. So here's an example of some of the hypodense lesions in his liver that represent metastases. And one of them showed a metastatic urethral carcinoma, um, which was a relatively pure sample. We thought it was around 70 percent. Um, I would have probably said 65%. This is the actual number from our fluid analysis, which gives us to the 0.7% range of actual sort of tumor cell content based upon clinical analyses of the, of the exome sequencing. Um, our immunohistochemistry stains that were done at the time proved that this was indeed a urethelial carcinoma with based upon some GATA3 immunohistochemical staining. So we're dealing with this old disease just in new sites. And the results of his genomic uh, testing showed that he had four genes with, uh, that were known in clinical relevance. And two of them um, were somatic mutations, and two of them were deletions, or some carbon alterations. So FGFR3 mutation was found in this patient's tumor sample, which uh, is a known mutation that's seen in bladder cancers, but it's typically seen in tumors of low grade and not those with high grade disease. And so if you look at the pathway development of bladder cancers, usually there's FGFR3 mutations that lead to hyperplasias and low grade pathway tumors that oftentimes never go on to become invasive or do treatment, except in rare occasions. And this particular, particular patient happened to be one of those rare occasions where this mutation went on to develop a high grade disease with metastases. Um, and in fact, there were clinical trials going on at this time for FGFR3 inhibitors and are still going on that had shown in literature some response um, with FGFR3 mutations, um, particularly with particular translocations, which this patient didn't have. But nonetheless, he was enrolled in one of these trials because of his FGFR3 mutation that was found and uh, showed a marked reduction as tumor nodules. Usually it'll go away completely, but as I mentioned, if we can even turn cancer into a long-term disease as opposed to a cure, that's better than dying of the disease itself. And so a year ago or so, he was started on this trial, and he's been on it ever since, and he's had a stable disease, and it's doing quite well, which is pretty miraculous for a guy who 10 years ago had a small cell bladder cancer who now has metastatic uh, high grade urethral carcinoma. The other findings that were, that were um, determined from his excellent sequencing test were that he also had a pic 3 ca mutation, um, which again is also involved in uh, the bladder cancer sort of developed pathway. Typically, this is more commonly seen in the uh, high grade pathways, as well as the P16 alterations that were found deletion wise, also again usually more in the high grade pathways with his 9P deletion. But both of those alterations also have clinical trials and drugs available. So um, there's PIP kinase inhibitors that are out there available for solid tumors, um, as well as some trials that are available for RB deletion or P16 deletions as the patient had. And so not only did we find him a trial that he's successfully been on for now for a year, but we also found two more alterations that have in line for him possible treatments and clinical trials available should he ever fail this FGFR3 uh, inhibitor. And so these were sort of the discussions and researches, uh, uh, um, research ideas that were discussed and brought forth at our tumor board conference for this patient um, to go on through and be treated with. Um, and so, you know, our, our meeting was quite sort of um, interesting because although the patient had already been started on his FGFR3 inhibitor, 
you know, of course, there are some people in the room, probably those who are more P16 researchers, or evolution researchers, that said we should have started on the other trial first instead of the FR3 trial. But um, I think this was a, a, a nice example of how a typical tumor or bladder cancer, which was the treated with platinum therapy and was treated once already, um, was a high grade tumor that doesn't usually have these mutations, was uh, detected on our XM16 test and underwent a clinical trial that's now been very successful for him. And um, you know, not, not all patients are like this, but I think a lot of them are. More, the more that we understand about diseases, the more that we're able to move forward with, on the research side, the more of these will have in the future, these sort of great success stories. Um, any questions about our program or? Yes? Who first? <laughs> Six questions? I think there's a three question on there. Go ahead. Anton? I did. I will start with your first presentation, please. Uh, you mentioned functional report, which you're right, and you mentioned that you have information about the drug screening. So, can you give more details how you do that? Like, uh, what samples you take, it's primary tumor cells, culture, and how do you convert? Uh, in the, uh, the in the right, and so, like I said, a lot of so this is also the research side that we do. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in my presentation tomorrow morning on the sort of the, the sort of the future of development. But um, most of the samples that we do for our drug screenings are, are metastatic samples, um, and we uh, usually try to develop organoids. As I think we talked to you before, we're about still only about fifty percent successful in growing them. But the ones that do grow, we're able to test um, usually after multiple passes in these samples. Um, and so that's usually the preferred method that we're focusing on. Um, we are also developing xenografts in mice, as well as working on zebrafish xenografts as well to be used. Because um, they're much, as you said, much smaller and easier to manage. <laughs> Um, but those are the those are the sort of uh, the main methods that we use. It's usually trying to do metastatic samples and organoid development. And we have a partnership with uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, so we have uh, access to their entire drug screening um, as, as they, they have an entire floor in our Belfer Research Building, where the institute is, is uh, housed, that uh, we are partnered with to look at sort of the screens. Is it the single drug concentration screening, or it's kind of it's it's um it's a microfluidic system that they use um, with a variety of, of concentrations and and uh, drugs at the same time. Um, the, no, the other question about making it back into the in vivo aspect that's a little bit more that's a little bit trickier. And so we're using the screening on the organoids. Um, of course, if the drug is not approved in the United States for anything, we can't really give it. But that's part of the research discovery is that if we find that it works in organoids, especially for certain tumor types, we can then start looking at sort of mouse models or mouse xenografts and if it starts to you know, work successfully in the mice, then it becomes one where the drug company will try to move to the phase zero human trial. So it's not, it's not an immediate uh, success for this particular patient, but again, it's part of the process of, again, the community of patients that are involved still ultimately in the future helping to help an individual patient in the future. So the, the, the clinical um, medical record system that we order from does get the report back. The detailed results are not there. It's just the summary of results because that's also the patient. The patients have access to that record as well. And so it's limited, or kind of limited to things that you know, the patient will need to understand. The actual data results themselves are what we have in the CBIO portal. And so that's where the research commissions can go and uh, look at specific patient sort of results as far as you know, frequencies or, or other alterations that are seen um, um, by logging in and just having the patient, all the samples are annotated by the patient's sort of unique identifier that we use. And so they can search for that to go patient's sort of profile and pull up the genomic results that way. We also, you know, the, they're all housed uh, in our uh, servers on site, so if there's even more detailed question that was asked by the clinician, which usually 
they're not that interested, the researchers who are, then the computational biologists can go back to the, the raw data and look at it in closer detail. Okay. Second time, I'm very Thank you. Again, it's, it's, it's not me, but it's a huge team effort. I'm just a little cog in the wheel, but uh, I'm glad to hear that you, you're learning things new because it means we're not standing still. Okay. And time. Or, Yes, we have six questions. There's no way you can answer. <laughs> All right, we can talk about coffee break, then we'll go back. Um, yes, sorry. You mentioned viruses, but I wonder if transposons, you know, the genetic role of the elements, play any role in tumor genesis. The, the transposons? Yeah. I mean, I think, it, I think it's. it's it's still up for debate and it's possible, but that's partly why we're interested in more putting those on our panel for discovery purposes than any sort of definite current clinical treatment. Um, because again, the, the, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so that we start developing er and learning this data, um, it will be interesting to see what we can sort of deduce and put into clinical practice or at least research-wise develop models for. Um, you know, I, I think that um, there are definitely tumors that Again, the, the, this is a very expensive way of finding it out by using genomic sequencing. Um, since we have, like, for instance, head and neck tumors and HPV status, we have a very quick and easy and simple stain, P16, that is a good surrogate for that. But um, if you want to know more about the subtype for risk of aging purposes, this will give you, you know, the, the HPV subtype that's present in the tumor sample. And that's what we're kind of starting with, but we'll see where it takes us, the information that we get. Yes, questions. Well, first question is about survival curve. I would, uh, I think your presentation will benefit greatly with survival curve. Yeah. I, I, mean, I agree, but uh, again, this is uh, this is personalized medicine, so N of one survival curve is 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 going to look very different. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not, it's not very useful. N of one survival curve. Uh, Just the number of patients that we have that survive, right? Sure, but then, but uh, well, I don't know, again, it's not sure what the control co cohort would be, and these patients are all different. Control is, well, that was my second question. Control is standard of care, of course. Right. So that's, that's right. Cool. So again, I mean, this is, uh, we're moving this forward. It, it, when you're doing sort of, um, I, I definitely understand and agree with, agree with your questions, but. Uh, we're trying to move this forward in clinical practice, and so these patients are enrolled as part of clinical trials, and so these are methods in which they can enroll on that, or try our own drugs and develop our own clinical trials, um, or use them off-label. And so, um, again, these are, these are patients that are usually on a third or fourth line of therapy. Um, because that's what's my next question. Don't you think it's... At least the patients will benefit if you start earlier than stage four, stage I, So I, I, I potentially agree with you. I mean, I think it's also, this is one of the questions about cancer research and selection bias, is if you find patients who are surviving after third and fourth line of therapy, then they probably already have some sort of unique survival benefit of their own, whether it's a tumor or their own genome, that these kinds of personalized medicines or last-ditch effort saviors uh, may be working so well because they're already pre-programmed to do well, regardless, regardless of treatment type. And so part of understanding it is going to be whether this, whether the order is important. And that's where I think we're looking into. But these, you know, these sort of last, last sort of questions or last sort of like um, niche efforts that we have and then moving forward with these patients is, um, are, are essentially the research part is to try to stimulate clinical trials for these mental findings, but um, so I don't care if help you for this. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. It's for you to convince them that you actually improve the efficacy of treatment. Sure, sure. I know. I, I, I'll look into that and see if we can get one for the next presentation. But um, I, I also don't want to present data that I think is misleading, and I'm mostly the survival curve of this nature. 
might be misleading. It would look, look great. I will go. So I will go. How many patients? So I found a patient. There is nothing misleading about that. Sure. Sure. That's only three. What is it? Yes. This is a more general one. So you mentioned about um, you know line communication and managing expectations within your team. So what is your experience about managing expectations on patients? Right. Um, so that can be that is just as not more important when utilizing these kinds of assays because um, you know I think that a lot of the results. You know, again, if they're, if they're very, very ill patients, the results may not be back in time to help them. Um, also, not every patient's going to have something that's identifiable to help them with, uh, right? So, you know, not every gene that has mutation is going to have a target that's usable. But not, you know, sometimes the patients get results back from a target panel of 50 genes of all the relevant mutations that have no mutations, which, you know, sometimes patients hard to understand. Well, how do I have a tumor if I don't have any mutations? They're driving it. But you know, that's part of understanding education of patients about the biology of just you know the human sort of uh, cancer in general. Um, so it really is important to, to speak with them, let them know that you know this is uh, you know, something that is potentially of great benefit to them, but in a minority of cases, I think still. So the odds are that nothing that will come out of this will directly help you. But you know, to them, um, we offer it sort of uh, you know with no cost to the patient. So there's nothing out of, you know aside from signing a consent and um, having the samples, which are usually all reflected in clinical diagnosis anyways. I'll talk about that after the break with how we process the samples. You know, I think that um, they have generally been very keen and very happy to be involved in this kind of program because they know it's part of sort of the altruism of medicine that they're contributing to potential, you know, their children and their, their grandchildren, and you know, that, that might help them. I think for the future, you know, it would be always realistic to develop this kind of program without the cost for the patients. We can obviously, when that would be introduced, or what might be introduced, right. maybe it might change completely the, I guess, you know, the, what they're expecting out of it. I don't know, just something for discussion. Yeah, no, it's so this. It's medicine, exactly. You said it's medicine in general, and, and it's something that that we that, that you know we felt was important. Um, and I think that even some of the, the from my experience, at least, some of the larger companies have found that as well. So I think that even uh, foundation medicine, if uh, the patient's insurance won't pay for it, they tend not to pursue a patient um, for for the bill to get paid. Um, that's sort of kind of really sort of nice of them as, a, as an industry company trying to make money um, that they don't really harass the, the patients for the samples or for the payments. There's a continuation of the question. So who pays for these patients right now? Uh, philanthropy. So our donors, our donors to Cornell and the New York Hospital um, and the initiatives that uh, they're interested in building are the ones that funded you know 10 plus million dollars for the first few years of this program um, and as we got our, our approval from the states to provide us the clinical service to the patients fully um, we're now able to start potentially billing for the insurance purposes from the test results but all of the other sort of research arms of the program and everything outside of the traditional sort of targeted panels or action sequencing results um, has all been done through um, philanthropy through the hospital and medical school um, and the validation aspects of it to some extent also through grants that have been written and developed based upon results of the prison medicine program. Um, we've been very successful in building, um, I think, uh, at least in our department alone, I think we've doubled our NIH grant funding um, based upon some of the results that have come out of these prison medicine programs. So it's been a very great source of food. Uh, development of our research arm. Okay, and uh, also, uh, you mentioned that uh, when the information uh, is being sent to the doctor and to the patient, the uh, patient decides, uh, also makes a decision about uh, what's going to be next. Uh, so, how is patient and his decision is being handled here? So, you know, that's a 
whenever I was in medical school, that was a big push in our training, is to give patients autonomy, you know, to move away from the older system of doctor just tells the patient what to do, and the patient doesn't. Um, especially, it has become more and more important as, you know, that was easier back in the day, especially whenever there was just one therapy, one option, and so that was all that you could do. But as we grow now, there's multiple options usually available to patients, and especially with these kinds of results. And of course, you know, a lot of patients still rely on the doctor. They don't want, they don't want to have any say, and they say, you just tell me what to do. But I think the patients who are more interested in their care, who are more sophisticated and educated about uh, medicine in general, um, those are the patients who really, the, our oncologists sit down with and say, you know, these are the, you know, two or three studies that are out there. You know, these are sort of, you know, in, in broad terms, these are sort of the complication rates of these therapies, these are success rates. Um, and again, I think it's, a, it's a, a relationship between the patient and the physician to develop, um, you know, how much each wants to know about the other's experience, the doctor's experience in treating patients with certain drugs and the patient's sort of um, experience with, you know, friends or relatives that have therapies. And so it makes it a more complicated discussion, but I think in the end, it's part of the whole process of managing patient expectations. If they understand that something may not be helpful to them, um, then, or may or may not be of use to them right away, then it's better for the point of the results. Same idea with the discussions of patients and doctors on the results. If the patients understand more about the treatment that they're choosing and they feel like they have the empowerment in choosing that decision, then they oftentimes are much more likely um, to uh, uh, follow through with the therapies and um, have a better outlook, I think, and, uh, on their outcomes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And now, our first coffee break, uh, half an hour or so. So, same place as in the morning. All right. Okay, well, let's continue our uh, uh, event. And Brian will like the second one. So, this is uh, the second talk. Um, was kind of geared more towards the laboratory and sort of technicians, pathologists that may or may not be in the room. So some of you may find it helpful, some may find it interesting, and some may just put a sleep through it. But uh, if nothing else, Albert, I would recommend providing an invitation to your pathology uh, the laboratory uh, pathologists here uh, if they're interested in making sort of the most of it that talent says. Because uh, as patients now, you know, are undergoing metastatic biopsies, small samples, and those are the ones that are critical for us to uh, sequence and understand what's going on with that. Um, we're having to do more and more with small and smaller pieces of tissue. And so I sort of think of this as like in the modern day struggle of pathologists is trying to make everyone happy while still doing our job. And so first and foremost, we still have to make a routine diagnosis by making a, a regular HME slide and looking at the microscope. And sometimes, and more frequently nowadays, we also have to do and give them typical staining on that tissue to make a diagnosis because it's not just uh, enough to say that it's carcinoma, but you know, in the lung, they want to know if it's squamous cell carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma, and that's not always obvious on the HME stain. Testing, um, which requires additional slides. But then, of course, clinicians also want the ancillary testing to help them know is there uh, an outcry arrangement which requires fish testing or in this chemistry for the most part. They also want to know what the EGFR status is, which is a like for test. And so all these things are adding up on top of the original diagnosis that we have to do. And depending upon how much sample we get, we need to make sure it's triage appropriately so all these things can happen. And you never know what's going to be going on in the future as well. You know, what kind of clinical trials are going to come down the road that you need to be able to go back to that sample and provide additional testing materials on that laboratory to enroll a patient on the clinical trial. Uh, what research projects is, you know, Albert and I know what to but they look at these tissues for to look at these samples. Um, and then, you know, final making or freezing of the tissue samples is another step that provides for additional test methodologies that are more research-based, but that are useful in developing new uh, treatments. And so dividing up the tissues into what's going to go for clinical diagnosis and what's going to go for freezing and the fresh tissue samples might want to be going for organoid development. And so it's really important to have a pathologist involved with the tissue collection and processing so that they can make sure the specimen is sorted out and sort of utilized in its best fashion. 
And as always, you know, our uh, patient is at the top of our list. And so the first thing we went to make sure is that we can make a clinical diagnosis. And so we always want to make sure that there's enough tissue submitted for the light microscopy so that we can um, even tell it's cancer or not cancer. Um, and so if you submit samples for uh, uh, frozen section, for tissue banking, for next-gen sequencing by, by frozen sections, we have in our, in our laboratory a process by which these samples are held in a laboratory until we have a diagnosis. And if we need to, we can review the h &E slides of that frozen material to make sure it doesn't change the diagnosis. And if it does, then we can also retrieve that materials and turn it into paraffin so that we can have that for our records and clinical diagnosis and utility for future tests because that's, again, always our first priority. Um, and so in all of this, you know, going back to my, my last talk too, communication is, is very, very important when dealing with these samples. Um, and you want to make sure that you know what the priorities are for that sample before the patient even comes into the procedure room. Because, uh, you know, most of the time they're looking for a clinical diagnosis only, I would say nowadays. They just want to know if it's cancer, excuse me, or not cancer. But then sometimes they'll already be enrolled in precision medicine, and so do they want whole exome sequencing or do they want RNA sequencing as a priority? Maybe the patient has already had a whole exome sequencing somewhere else and they don't want to waste the tissue for that. They want to see what the RNA is doing. Um, sometimes these biopsies are for research only. They don't even need a diagnosis clinically and we can just give the whole thing to the lab. But we need to know that ahead of time when it comes to us so that um, the specimens are utilized in the fashion that's um, most important for the patient in the end. So again, uh, going back to this, the, the SOPs and the procedure manuals, have everything in place. We have a nice detailed manual for how to handle our precision-vetted specimens, um, very you know, down to the detail of how to even stain the samples for, for frozen section analysis. Um, we have a, a protocol in place for how to handle certain types of tissues, like bones, which are very difficult to process in laboratory. Um, another addendum for larger section specimens, which is like a field day for pathologists, because you have all the tissue in the world to give out. Um, and so each specimen type has its own protocol, and this is what we developed for our bone biopsy. So before, uh, you know, before precision medicine, everything just went into decalcification solution and put into paraffin blocks. And you know, we all have experience with decal and that messing up all of our NGS assays. And so you know, there was a need for this to change with the addition of molecular testing, especially to metastatic bone biopsies. Um, and also if, if samples are frozen for research purposes, the frozen samples can't be decalcified, but they also don't cut under the microtome because the bone just chips and blows away all the cells. And so you can't even see what's in, in the bone. So you just sort of, oftentimes we were blind sequencing these biopsies. And so, you know, one of the protocols that we put in place was to really sort of diligently evaluate the bone and, you know, anything that's cortical bone, the thick bone, we just always put in formalin for clinical diagnosis because there's almost nothing going to be there that's useful for research or, or sequencing. Um, and then the rest of the bone, the marrow, was, was divided up based upon sort of how calcified it felt grossly in the laboratory. So the pieces that had more bone spicules in it, that's what we would submit for clinical diagnosis decalcification. Um, and the marrow that was the softest pieces of marrow was what was submitted either for non-decalcification blocks for potential FFPE paraffin embedded samples or frozen for NGS-based assays or other research purposes. And so, you know, no longer are we just throwing these in cassettes and processing them, but we're actually doing almost like a full resection, a full analysis of the tissue samples of just small bone biopsies to make sure that each sample is put into a method that allows for the most testing to be done on those. And we also found too that previously the clinicians, you know, when you, when you drill into a bone, it bleeds a lot. Um, and we also found that that blood is very valuable. It often has a lot of tumor cells in it. So no longer are we having the clinicians toss that away or sort of wipe it off with a cloth, but we have that placed um, into saline or into formalin if we want to process it and submit that to us as well. Because there's been uh, numerous times that I can tell you the bone biopsy was all crushed or unusable, but the blood clots or aspirates that are around the blood clot had tons and tons of tumor cells um, that were usable for, for NGS assays or, or other uh, organoid development even. Um, we also have a protocol in place that tells us sort of how much tissue we need for diagnosis based upon the history of the patient. So we, that's why we wanted to know before the procedure even begins, obviously, or ideally the day before, 
so we can look into the history and I can say, okay, well, this patient just had a biopsy three months ago that was cancer. This is from the same site. I need very, very little to diagnose the di to make the diagnosis, and most of the sample can go for uh, biobanking or for research. Um, also, if the patient has a cytology specimen at the same time, so they have a cytologist on site saying there's cancer in the specimen, then I need less of that biopsy to make a diagnosis because I know that the cytologist already has enough to make a call of cancer, um, and so on and so forth. And ideally, we if you know there's no do no diagnosis at all and it's an unknown site then that's usually when we require two or three cores to be maintained with us for clinical diagnosis and then anything additional than that can go out. But these are sort of the kind of algorithms that we have in place to make sure that we still don't miss a diagnosis um, and the patient ultimately comes out with the right treatment. Um, as I mentioned, we always have these samples on site so that we can retrieve them and turn them into a clinical FFPE paraffin block um, if needed for diagnosis purposes or workup. Um, and so there's a variety of sample types that we process for our, our, our precision medicine program. Everything from you know, just a smear of cells from an FNA procedure to the whole resection of an organ. Um, with the cytology specimens and the smears, you know, as, you, as you can imagine, it's just a few cells that are smeared out into a slide. And that's pretty much the only record of the procedure whatsoever. And so any utilization of those slides for anything else destroys the material. And usually it's not enough to do anything with anyways, other than make a diagnosis. So we usually tell our, 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 our radiologists who do these biopsies, do more, do more than this if you want anything more to be done with the patient's samples. Um, and, you know, if you make only, you know, the fewer smears you make, the more that you can put into formalin for future processing or for saline. Um, but it's very variable, as I'll show you in a little bit. So this is an example of a cytology smear you can make uh, from an FNA procedure. And there's lots of tumor cells that are present here. But again, this is all the material. And so if you try to use these cells for anything sequencing-wise, you can never go back to them. Which in the days, uh, in the current days of very high quality digital imaging, you can scan the slide and make a record of it. But you know that, that um, may pose a challenge in the future if you need to um, retrieve it or, God forbid, there's some, you know, uh, I guess warehouses or storage units can go, can burn down, but servers can also crash and data be lost. And so, you know, it's sometimes nice to have both methods available for future. But again, usually this is very limited material and um, it destroys that's present. If you have a, a, a thin prep solution of fluid, you can make one slide and re retain the rest of the fluid for future analyses and samples processing. But it's usually that it's a very uh, limited amount that you can do and not get very many, not very tests out of that. So usually we ask for a core biopsy, but biopsies can also be easily exhausted for testing purposes. Because if you look at the, 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 the paraffin block and the tissue that's in it, it looks you know, like a plentiful amount of tissue. But if you make you know, three h and &E slides to look at for diagnosis, and then you need to do immunohistochemistry to confirm that diagnosis, You've now sort of gone back to the block multiple times and cut through it. And after your original clinical diagnosis, this is all that's left, which is not enough to do anything with for any NGS-based testing. Um, and so while biopsies look great, if you don't use them properly, they can be gone in, in you know, a day for diagnosis purposes. Um, so what we started implementing in our laboratory, um, which does increase costs a little bit, but ultimately we're there to help the patient, and so we think that it's beneficial in the end, is that for our biopsies, um, with the knowledge that they're almost always going to require some sort of ancillary testing, is that for the initial biopsy block, we cut unstained slides up front so that you don't keep going back and cutting into the tissues further and further. You just make one H&E of the slide and then 10 unstained slides afterwards. And so that will preserve the block so that you can have an H&E diagnosis, you can do you know, multiple immunohistochemical stains on the test, have some left over, and then you still have plenty of tissue left in the block to add to that if you need to go back for a clinical test. So unlike the original samples that were submitted you know, a few years ago where you had an H&E and and multiple um, multiple h &E slides cut, which kind of is a waste of diagnosis tissue because they don't usually look that much different. So one h &E slide, uh, two is what we do now, so we have a carbon copy almost, so if something does get lost or broken, we have it. We just make two serial sections and make 10 unstained slides, and then if we need to, we can go back and get, you know, ultimately 10 to 15 more slides from that block for ancillary testing, send out testing, um, exome sequencing. We also learned that we 
don't want to cram all onto uh, our eggs into one basket. So previously we would get a sample, and again, this is a, a, a small but incremental increase in cost to the laboratory, but it's a matter of usually you know a, a dollar or two per sample. Um, but it really improves the utility of these for all the testing that's needed now for patient care. So instead of cramming all the cores into one block, we now put one or two cores per block. And so that we can now get, instead of 10 slides from one block, we can get 50 slides from four or five blocks, which really increases the amount of testing that can be done in these samples. Um, but of course, we don't do this for all of our blocks up front. Um, so for instance, in this sample of having multiple blocks of cores for one patient biopsy, biopsy setting, we only order the unstained slides on the very first core, which is generally the largest and plumpest core. Why don't you just cut the entire thing up front? Well, part of it is that the stability of tissues on a slide is really not as stable as in the block itself. And so if you cut the slides up front, they may not be good five years down the road, but the block itself still would be to go back to. So this is something that sort of we've um, uh, talk about with our clinicians so that, again, we can manage their expectations with the patients and what the procedure is. And so, you know, thinking about sort of what's the minimum needed for these different tests. So, you know, for a diagnosis of cancer, I need only about, you know, 20 cells to be able to say, okay, that's malignant. But if you ultimately want whole exome sequencing on that sample, I'm going to need about 120,000 of those, which in the grand scheme of thing usually means, you know, 10 to 20 unstained slides. Um, as opposed to just the one H E for diagnosis. And these are all cumulative, so that you know, if you do a hotspot testing panel and then an exome sequencing, you now need 20 slides. Um, and you never know what's going to be. So for things like um, very scant cytology aspirates, you know, the cytologists may say it's adequate. And when adequate, they mean for diagnosis. I can call it cancer. But that's pretty much where it stops. It's not good for anything beyond that. Because if I say it's cancer and there's malignant cells present and this is all I have on the slide, you're not going to be able to do anything with these few cells as far as future testing for even an immunohistochemical stain, um, unless you have like a thin prep. So generally it's good enough for diagnosis, but maybe H&E, but really nothing else. If you have uh, a cell block that you can make out of paraffin materials uh, from an FNA procedure or you have a small core biopsy, it's really uh, hit or miss as to what's doable. Um, so for instance, this sample is a cell block, so it's a blood clot of a procedure that has a lot of lymphoid infiltrate in there, but also has a fair amount of tumor cells present. And you can definitely work this up with immunochemistry. I can certainly give enough slides for a fish analysis, for alkyl rearrangement. Um, I can probably, in our experience, or our laboratory at least, even get enough material out of those few cell clusters to do a targeted sort of like hotspot panel mutational assay. Um, I, we've even used them for um, larger panels, um, and occasionally they will be enough material even for exome sequencing, but that's usually the rarity. Um, ultimately, we like to have at least three or four cores of tissue, um, and preferably spread over multiple blocks if you want to start getting all of these things out of a sample. And so again, as I said earlier, don't put all your uh, eggs in one basket, or similarly, you know, uh, putting, having plenty of cores, you know, putting them all in one block is kind of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, where the samples are plentiful and the clinician did a great job of getting you tumor, but you put them all in one block and then you're gone in 10 slides. And so, you know, all three of these cores um, put into one block, you're going to be able to get, you know, 20 or 30 slides, but if you put them into separate blocks, you're going to be able to get 90 to 120 slides. Um, so, sort of just to summarize what these, the, the laboratory processing protocols is, you always want to have, again, that communication line open before, during, and after collection, so that you know where to send the specimens and you know what's coming in. Make sure there's, there's protocols in place and a sort of experienced pathologist assistance pathologists to make sure that they know, because um, they, they're the best to be able to say, um, you know, this piece of tissue grossly looks like tumor, or this is the, the, the one that's most likely to have the sectionable materials, like from bone biopsies, to be useful. Um, and spread those samples over multiple different aliquots, just like you do for preservation purposes in the laboratory. Don't put them all in one block because you're going to be using, you know, the, the only one person gets the samples, then not 20 people. Um, cut those slides up front for clinical samples if possible. Um, and again, manage expectations for the oncologist. So the oncologist puts in a request on a fine needle aspiration for whole exome sequencing. You probably should talk to them before the procedure happens and say, is there any way that you can get me a core biopsy for that because I'm not going to be able to do it for you off of an FNA alone. 
um, and they, then the, you know, they don't come back to you when the results don't come back that they want, and they get upset for you know, not talking to you and, and managing sort of what's possible with these small samples. Um, so that, uh, I'll take any questions on sort of, the, sort of how our laboratory handles the specimens to be able to maximize their utilization. Thanks. Thank oh, Jenzu. Sorry, can I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned about organoids. So yes. Yes. Or, yeah, so yes. We don't preserve the frozen tissue to make organoids. No, we have not used any frozen samples to develop organoids. We always use fresh tissue. Which we we tried it, I think, once or twice, and was completely unsuccessful. So it's always the fresh tissue samples, and that's where it starts to become a little bit tricky with how to triage the specimens, especially small biopsies. If it's a large piece of tissue from a tumor resection, I can grossly say that this is tumor and then I can you know, easily give pieces of tissue for organoid development. But um, it's a balance whenever it's a small biopsy, which is a string of piece of tissue that's less than a millimeter thick and it all looks the same, like white, thin tissue, to know what's tumor and what's not tumor. Um, and that's where we really rely upon either our cytology um, uh, friends to be on site with an FNA to make an FNA before the diagnosis to know that they have enough material or what we can do in the laboratory if there was not an uh, FNA done at the same time is take the core biopsies and do a light touch preparation onto a glass slide and then we can get an idea if there are malignant cells present or not. If there are then we can say that that core is a positive core at least by initial analysis and split them up that way so that if we have two or three cores of touch preps showing malignant cells, you know, one of the cores I'd feel comfortable with then giving for organoid development. Because once I give that for organoid development, it's never coming back to me. It's not like the frozen materials I can make an H and E of and look at. So I have to be comfortable that I have at least one or two cores with positive cells in it before I want to give away um, the tissues for organoid development when it's a core biopsy. Same thing with the blood clots. If we get blood clots from an aspiration or other smear, we can make, take you know, one or two of the little blood clots and make a smear of that in the laboratory and look at it and see how cellular it is. So if there are a lot of tumor cells in that blood clot, then it's more likely to be successful for organoids and also for diagnosis. And I'm more comfortable splitting that up into different sample types or different laboratories for organoid development. But how long can you keep samples before you actually start? So we. Uh, right. So this the smears that we make, the touches that we make, um, are done right there in the laboratory where we dig, make our frozen sections, and we have the the H and E staining materials. And so it really only takes a few minutes to make a touch prep and stain it and look at it under the microscope. Um, and in general, you know, sometimes these samples don't arrive to us within 30 to 45 minutes from the, from the surgical suite or the IR suite. Um, and so, you know, adding a few minutes time to the, to the sample preparation in the laboratory and looking at it in the microscope um, has not really affected the viability for these and it really helps us maximize the samples that are used for organoid development. Um, and that's why I will say it's part of the communication loop when you have these programs in place um, with the laboratories is also having the transportation on time and available. So, have, so our clinic team for the precision medicine is really great in that they are also sort of take charge of being in contact not only with the pathology lab to receive the specimen or the clinician who enrolled the patient, but it's usually a third clinician who's doing the biopsy. So the oncologist enrolled the patient, but a radiologist or a surgeon is the one that's removing the procedure, removing the specimen. And so it's really important that all three of those people are in the loop and the clinic team, the sort of our, the, they take on the burden in some sense of being very proactive and calling the operating rooms you know, is the specimen is the specimen started? Is it coming out soon? What time is it going to be there? So that we really have um, our transport um, uh, technicians immediately present and available to go to the lab, go to go to the OR, and right back to the lab, so that it really can be uh, submitted to organoid development within an hour usually from the procedure. But that's a key key part that I forgot, you know, kind of left out. But they're they're instrumental. They're they're, they're if not more important than the faculty and the physicians in the program, is the people who transport that materials in timely fashion. So related to that, Brian, if you were um, starting from scratch, 
what sort of infrastructural arrangements would you have to improve or, or streamline the process? Would you have your path lab much closer to the surgical suites or to minimize, like, where, where's the bottlenecks and risks? Yeah, so I definitely, you know, the, the closer that the, the pathology laboratory or biobanking laboratory facilities are to the clinical, you know, uh, suites is helpful. Um, luckily, you know, in our institution, it's all right there in one building, and so it's just an elevator right away. But um, even in our new building across the street, we have a small satellite area set up so that pathology is right there next to the suites. It's a small room, but it's a, it's a room that's, that's big enough to allow for um, at least h &E staining and a microscope and some glass slides for smears development. And so at least at that point, you know, and also, you know, a fridge with all of the different media types for growth and development so that it will all be done right there closer to the suite. So even, you know, just like a, you know, um, a small room adjacent to the surgical suites can really improve um, the success rates and uh, improve the workflows. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do they take biopsy now from every surgery? Or it's still it's not, not, not from every procedure. Um, I, I don't. I would, I the number 10 percent, 15 I would say for it's around probably 25 percent of our institution now. The biopsies are patients enrolled in precision medicine or bedside biopsies. You know, I, I think right now we're, we're usually getting around 10 to 15 patients a week that are undergoing biopsy for precision medicine, and you know, probably. 30 to 40 patients that are from biopsies in general for metastatic disease. So it's probably around a quarter. Um, but it's growing, thankfully. Thank you. This is next to uh, my fellow ladies, right? Okay. Uh, my consulting director, Elsevier, and uh, also very just experience on precision medicine. So what? What do I do? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, it works. Uh, so, uh, I have a task of uh, compressing one hour talk in 20 minutes. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> and uh, I will try to sort of echo some of the uh, issues discussed earlier. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to um, skip what Elsevier does uh, for now. Uh, just, I work for the branch of Elsevier that work on uh, advancing uh, uh, knowledge bases and use of this knowledge basis for various applications, including cancer biology. So, uh, and the work I'm going to present is uh, part of our collaboration with a clinic on personalized oncology that is located in North Carolina. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, about the clinic. So what I'm going to uh, discuss today is uh, uh, the computational approaches, how to figure out the mechanism of cancer based on analysis of biopsy from transcriptomics data, and then uh, find, based on this mechanism, which has uh, basically understanding the hallmark pathways of cancer, find the drugs that can be used to target the most active uh, components of the pathways, and all these drugs, uh, FDA-approved drugs, there are, believe it or not, 400 already FDA-approved drugs for uh, cancer. So, and the challenge here uh, really is uh, not to find new drug, but to find the right drug for, for the patient. Uh, so I will, uh, to give you sort of set the, uh, um, the mindset, I usually start by extending the central dogma. Uh, so to the left you see uh, this is uh, the picture I found on Google. 
this is all I can find on Google uh, about uh, the central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein. So, but uh, what scientists do and what is described in the literature is uh, what's happened after that. What, what's the end of the process for making the protein and then, then there is also protein modification. All these changes protein activity, right? And protein activity is already abstract concept. This is something cell does not, it's not a physical uh, concept, it's a, a mental concept that how people interpret what's going on inside the cell. And at the end, then, uh, the protein activity influences different biological processes, which is yet another abstract concept that we have, we use to describe what's going on inside the cell. Okay? So this is not the part of physical world, this is part of our world, how we view and describe the, what's going on inside, inside the cell. And that's what uh, the software that uh, Elsevier has, called Pathway Studio, uh, uh, does. It uh, provides the means and tools to interpret omics data. Uh, most of the time people use uh, transcriptomics data, gene expression data for analysis in our software, but uh, we are not limited to transcriptomics data. We can analyze all kinds of omics data. Uh, so, uh, Elsevier developed an um, uh, uh, approach to mine the literature, uh, scientific literature, and compile the biggest uh, biological knowledge base in the world. Uh, so, uh, to echo what uh, Nigel said, so if you think about bringing together, advantages of bringing together thousands of scientists in one building, we are bringing together two million biologists in one database. So that's essentially what uh, our uh, artificial intelligence NLP software does by uh, reading all scientific literature and bringing all the knowledge from all this literature into one place. So using the interactions that we find in the literature, and there are about 10 million right now of these interactions, and, uh, the, uh, it's growing. I don't know if you're aware that there is uh, about roughly 100,000 papers in biology published every month. Okay? And uh, so there is no human in the world that could, can read them all, so we develop a software to do it. So uh, we also uh, use this uh, interactions that we find to build the disease models, and the first disease we basically went after is uh, cancer, of course. And uh, we use a, a sort of paradigm that was described in, uh, fairly recently in uh, one of the journals published by Elsevier Cell, uh, that uh, states that there is a 10 hallmarks of cancer. This is the screenshot from uh, that paper. And uh, basically, it's a review article. We use review articles uh, very often to build the me mechanistic models of uh, various cancers. And uh, uh, what's important to uh, sort of uh, understand here is that uh, each tumor can be driven by one of these 10 hallmarks, maybe more than one, but each hallmark also can have uh, uh, several thousand different mechanisms, okay? So the challenge is to understand which of these mechanisms exist in, this in the patient tumor, and then hopefully the drugs are known for this mechanism so we can basically kill the tumor. Uh, the, the, uh, right now, we have uh, more than 180 pathways uh, for uh, 10 hallmarks. This effort, initial effort is finished, but uh, the, data, uh, the collection of pathways is growing. It's ongoing effort, and it will be ongoing for a while so, uh, once we accumulate more data. Of course, and more data is published in the literature. So now I'm uh, going to tell you in more details how we find active pathways that are responsible for tumor growth. Uh, this is done by statistical methods. 
Um, you may have heard of the, uh, the causal reasoning, uh, we call it subnetwork enrichment analysis, which is more general name for this type of algorithms. Uh, what is required as an input for this algorithm is the omics data. And uh, I'm going to talk exclusively about gene expression data, for, uh, but again, uh, it can, uh, the same algorithm can be used for analysis of phosphoproteomics data, just proteomics data, and so on. Uh, so, uh, what omics data essentially does, it provides you the list of biomarkers. So another way to sort of to look at it, we just need a list of biomarkers that is obser that observed in particular tumor. Uh, and uh, based on these uh, differentially expressed biomarkers, we can go upstream in the network and find uh, transcriptional regulators that are responsible for, uh, for differential expression in the tumor. So all these links that you see here, extracted from the literature, so there is observation in the literature that this transcription factor regulates this gene, this gene, and this gene. And then what we do for all transcription factors and for all other regulators, we compare all the biomarker profiles and then find uh, transcription regulators that have the biggest differential expression downstream of them. Okay? So uh, it all happens within minutes. Um, usually less than a minute. And the output of this algorithm is a list of uh, uh, regulators ranked by uh, how much differential expression happens downstream of them, which is essentially the activity of these regulators. So what uh, we do next is we take this list of uh, uh, regulators and the activity calculated by the algorithm, and uh, we find pathways that we build manually, uh, the, uh, the, mainly from uh, the literature uh, uh, review articles describing different uh, cancer mechanisms. So uh, this slide actually tells you how we, uh, where these interactions come from. Uh, so uh, the biological biomedical literature is full of uh, different experiments that describe how transcription factors, hormones, receptors, and other molecules regulate transcription of different genes. This is how biologists study activity of proteins anyway. So we put all this information together in one database and uh, we get uh, roughly about 300,000 uh, expression regulations. We have more regulations of other types, but for the uh, actually, not 300,000, apparently 650,000 already, uh, 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 <coughs> expression regulation. So this is uh, another input for this algorithm. So omics data and the interactions observed in the literature. So if you kind of think of a little bit, uh, first of all, uh, the algorithm itself uh, uh, does not require the uh, a regulator to be differentially expressed, right? Because it doesn't use a data about regulator at all. It uses the data about what's going on downstream of this regulator. Uh, another thing that is important to understand that, uh, of course, it's better to know all possible tar expression targets for each regulator, but for statistical comparison, you don't need to know all of them. All you need to know is uh, statistically representative fraction of these targets to compare activity of these regulators. So, uh, to uh, uh, skip uh, sort of justification part of all this, uh, bottom line it all works, <laughs> and this was proven by uh, uh, using this methodology in, by our medical collaborators in North Carolina, personalized hermatology oncology clinic in Wake Forest. So this is the address of the people. You can go on their website and learn more how they do it. It's a small clinic. You don't need a lot of money uh, to do this. Uh, they license our software. They needed a lot of help in, in, in analyzing this data, and that's what we did with them. This is what is the basis of our collaboration. But uh, the picture that you see here is a complete 
disappearance of tumor of their first patients. And that's, you know, that was the reason they stuck with us, is because the first patient we uh, analyzed and recommended treatment survived until now for almost four or five years. And let me tell you what patients they take. They take patients that fail completely out of the system. They take only terminally ill patients. As that was told by the hospitals that they have uh, six months to live. Uh, so, uh, these patients went through all the standard of care and uh, uh, basically the system failed. So that was their first patient that still lives. Uh, I don't have survival care failure, Brian, sorry. So I, I, I know I, I put a little bit of pressure on you, but I'm on the same boat, okay? So, <laughs> uh, my challenge is, is to get some statistics from that guy, uh, and uh, you know, we have pretty good professional relationships, but I cannot get statistics from him. So he keeps coming back to us with more analysis and entire password collection that we build, essentially based on the analysis of his patients. Uh, we analyzed more than 20 or 30, uh, patients already, and uh, a lot of input was just to explain what we see in different tumors. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is another patient uh, in, uh, with uh, metastasis in lung, and uh, again, it's, uh, he survived. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly we have individual success stories, uh, but no statistics. So this is sort of the high-level view what software will do for you, if properly driven. So we, uh, so, uh, this method, uh, uh, Subnetwork Enrichment Analysis, SNA, will find you uh, upstream expression regulators. In this case, it's protein scale 5 and VEGF. And it also will find you cancer hallmarks that are activated uh, in the tumor. And you, uh, what password analysis does is really, it just matches it, uh, uh, these expression regulators with uh, cancer hallmarks. In, in this particular example, VEGF is responsible for blood vessel development. I don't know if you can see here, but basically it's uh, angiogenesis. And KLF5 uh, seems more responsible for epithelial to mesenchymal transition just based on the number of expression targets here. So the question is, okay, so we can uh, uh, understand this, but what actual pathway where KL, uh, KFL5 is involved? And uh, what actual pathways which uh, VGFA is involved? And I'll tell you in a moment why we need to know the pathway, because we need to know that uh, we have to find the drug. So this is actual patient data. It's a very rich information uh, image. Uh, uh, but uh, basically what it shows you is uh, differential expression of genes. So red means expression goes up, uh, uh, blue means expression goes down. What's important is to see that some of the blue uh, proteins here are, have red highlight. And red highlight is activity of this protein uh, determined by subnetwork enrichment analysis. So even though differential, by differential expression the protein goes down, its activity goes up according to its biomarker profile. Okay, and that's uh, that's one of the key uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, key advantages of this approach that we not only uh, look at differential expression, we actually can figure out the activity of the proteins, and obviously for many receptors or transcription factors. They don't have to be uh, uh, upregulated to increase the activity, right? They, have to, they can be phosphorylated, they can be cofactors that can be uh, uh, differentially expressed and so on. So, and uh, that's exactly what's happening in this uh, picture. And most of the uh, highlights here is red, I think, of all of them, which means that the whole pathway is actually upregulated. 
And what you also already can see is uh, some, uh, why we need pathway is because not all proteins in this pathway will have uh, drugs. Not all proteins are druggable. So even though we will find active uh, components, active proteins in this pathway, we need to find in the pathway those proteins that have drugs. So we can inhibit this pathway. And uh, you can sort of see it, um, some of the drugs already. Um, so uh, I already, I'm going to skip this slide. This is just uh, uh, illustration or statement again that uh, pathway activity is not equal to differential expression of the components. It is equal to differential expression of pathway biomarkers, which is downstream of that. Okay? So and that's what essentially we do. We find the pathway activity based on the biomarker profile of each pathway. So and this is the illustration of why pathway analysis is important is because Okay. This is a pathway of, uh, uh, of, uh, that regulates uh, uh, exit of the cell from quiescent state into actively proliferating state. FOXN1 is probably, you've heard of FOXN1 a lot, uh, for those who studied pretty much uh, some uh, cancer uh, samples, they know about FOXN1. So again, this is a real patient data from North Carolina. Remarkably, you know, the left of the pathway that is responsible for driving activating cell cycle is all red. Uh, to the right, uh, the blue part is actually a negative regulator of this cycle that is responsible for driving tumor back, uh, not tumor, cell into quiescent state. And that's all blue, which means it's down regulated. So that's, that's the reason tumor grows. It's all good. We can explain it. The picture looks nice. Problem is there is no drugs for FOXM1 and for any of these uh, active regulators that were found by the SNA. So what we had to do is to go upstream of FOXM1 and uh, there is a protein called uh, CDK4 that uh, have several drugs on the market uh, that uh, seems to be responsible uh, for regulating this pathway and that's exactly why we need pathway analysis. Uh, because not always active uh, proteins are druggable. So we can go, if, if you so go further, uh, we can not only find druggable targets, in this case, uh, we, if pathway has several druggable targets, we can find a drug that targets several active components of this pathway. And uh, this drug probably is more optimal for the patient because it hits uh, the same pathway in multiple, basically, points and should be more effective against this pathway. So not only we can help to find the drug, we can actually help to optimize or select the most effective therapy. Uh, so, additionally, uh, we uh, also have in the database the translational data that was done mostly for in case of cancer in cell lines. Uh, so, uh, this is actually Varinostat is one of the drugs that we prescribed to, that, uh, to the first patients and that's why she still lives. Uh, so, and uh, she had a uh, uh, cancer. And um, uh, the efficacy of virinostat against gallbladder was shown only in cell line. So it's, uh, um, it wasn't even FDA approved, let's put it this way, for gallbladder at all. Uh, uh, yet this is, was a terminally ill patient that doctor could prescribe uh, this drug. And uh, uh, it was successful. All right, so uh, you saw this picture from, uh, I think, Br uh, Brian talk. This is very similar to sort of cycle. Uh, uh, I, I got it from New York Times, I think. And New York Times could have got it from you, actually. 
you as a self city. But, uh, uh, so, w w um, it, it, you know, the names here can be different from Brian's cycle, but the idea is very similar. So, uh, you, you start with biopsy, and now, uh, we, uh, instead of biopsy, I know that uh, uh, Albert is doing uh, uh, circulating tumor cells now. So, so each of these uh, stages of cycle can be improved technologically, but the cycle will remain. So uh, people were doing transcriptomics data using gene expression microarray, and it's actually still the technology that uh, our medical collaborator in North Carolina uses. Now they do NGS and single cell sequence. But the idea is the same, measure transcriptomics uh, data in the tumor. And then uh, you can uh, grow primary cells and test the drugs. Uh, there are 400 drugs to test. If you, I don't know if you can put, uh, have them all in one place for just actual testing. But what our software does, it will point you to the most likely drug candid uh, candidates that you can then test in the clinic. Uh, again, uh, right now our collaborator completely uh, skips this step. They don't do any uh, 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 laboratory testing before they prescribe a drug. For various reasons, it's, it's expensive, but certainly because people just have six months to live, so they just don't have time to do it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so and then uh, you prescribe the drug, and uh, if it's successful, uh, so you, uh, you stop the cycle. What usually happens is, uh, Brian shows that in two years or three years, patient may come back and then the cycle will have to be repeated uh, because the cancer uh, uh, remiss itself, right? So uh, this is actually, again, this cycle I took, uh, uh, described, this is just copy paste from Oncology 3.0 uh, uh, website. Uh, yeah. So that's it, that's just some uh, references that we have uh, for this approach. And uh, we certainly look forward for more collaborators and uh, uh, we offer all kind of help to analyze patients and prescribe drugs with it. <laughs>